Hello, humans, and welcome to another episode of Gen X Gamer. We're going to do a recap of the first part of Billy Mitchell's uh, Day 7 trial with Carl Jobs. Let me tell you, when I read this, I found it to be really interesting. I'm doing this for the benefit of you guys, uh, so you can keep on um, listening to this. You know, it's different when people tell you their opinions of what happened. I think it's better for you to actually read the text. I know a lot of you can't do it because you're driving, you're at work, but maybe this is something you can listen to. It's just the reader from the internet reading the the first part of the testimony. It's really long. So I broke it down into two. And this first part, the one that you're going to listen to today, are the arguments made by um, Carl Jobs' barrister to the judge. And uh, let me give you my opinion here. Um, I think that the lawyer for Billy Mitchell did a a better job of presenting his case, even though it's a weaker case, you know, based on everything that I, that I've read so far, the, the lack of a good presentation by Carl Jobs lawyer, I think really did affect them. And you're going to see some of the pointing questions that the judge is asking here and some of the weaknesses in the case. Um, you know, a lot of people think that this is just a slam dunk home run, and I don't know, you know, I don't know by the questions that this judge is asking, and I'm not going to go through them. You guys can listen to them, but this is the impression that I have. Um, I think that Carl Jobs had a, a better case than was presented and that his lawyers, because of lack of funds, you know, whatever it is, I don't know how much these guys are charging. And this is my layman's opinion. I'm not a legal expert. I've been in court, <laughs> but I don't know anything about the law. I don't know anything about Australian law for sure. But it looks like Carl Jobs' lawyer is trying to make up for lost time here and trying to argue his points with the judge trying to get to see things that he may not have presented during the trial. And, you know, I just get this, this feeling from this judge that he already came to the to some conclusions here based on what he's arguing with this lawyer about. But I'll let you deduce those for yourselves, right? And you guys can make your own inferences. You know, going to to trial is is like flipping a coin. You know, and, and you're gonna have to forgive me for my rough voice here. Um, is it's like going to court, and and it's like flipping a coin. You don't know what's gonna happen. You know, especially, I find this interesting because I'm not, you know, I'm familiar with Australian law. In the U.S., this wouldn't even be a case, (laughs) I don't think, right? It's just people talking smack on the internet. And the fact that it got all the way to this point is entertaining, right? But incredible, incredible that two men of this age couldn't have solved this. And to me, the more interesting part is, what is the internet doing to people on YouTube? You know, what what would make you go on YouTube and, and take legal cases to this extent? Now, uh, you know, if you talk about Carl, you know, you're talking about somebody who people were supporting. You know, apparently it's a millionaire was going to give him money, he even offered a settlement which, you know, which Billy Mitchell turned down. And at that point, it should have been, okay, well, you turned it down. What is it that you want? What is it that you want me to say? Guys, and I've told you before, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, going to trial, the only ones who win are the lawyers, right? But this video is long enough, but you will find it interesting. If, If you follow this trial, if you followed this story for this many years, you're gonna find some real interesting nuggets here, so. Let me be quiet. My voice is running out. And you listen to Perfect Pac-Man. They, they, you know, the guy does a great job. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's the title is going to be on the video. I'm going to put a link to his page because all credit due to him for doing such a, a great job entertaining us. And, um, you know, he's he did it all out of pocket. You know, I'm usually not into supporting people and and he and I may have different points of views 
but it's thanks to him that we're getting this this entertainment, right? That we're getting all this information. So for those of you who support him, you know, go go right ahead or wish to support him. You know, and the expenses he's incurring because these are all out of pockets. This is for him is is <laughs> he's doing it as a hobby. You know, as far as I can tell. Uh, none of this is monetized for him. He's just taking donations, I think, for people who want to support, you know, it's him flying out there and, and doing all this work that we all get to enjoy. All right, humans, <clears throat> that's enough for me. Well, listen to the video. Let me tell you, there's some real interesting stuff here, particularly listening to the arguments back and forth between the judge and Carl's barrister. All right, have a great one. I'll catch you on part part two. And I should have that uh, tomorrow. Take care. Carl versus Billy, Day 7. October 23rd, 2024 Comments, 41. By Airzats underscore cats. Hello again. We've finally made it to our final leg of trial day coverage of the nearly finished legal battle between disgraced gaming hack job Billy Mitchell and absolute legend Carl Jobst. With the partial exception of, Day 1, Day 7, isn't like anything that came before it. The witnesses have all been called. The evidence has all been entered. Today, we're left with only closing arguments. It was basically as if the barristers themselves are testifying directly to the judge, making their cases, while calling back to particular bits of testimony and evidence that were presented in the course of days 1 through 6. In other words, the trial becomes a theater of just three characters. I would like to thank you all for your patience with this update, and apologize for the delay. Going in, I thought this would be the easiest day to summarize, and instead it became the most complicated. Things got very repetitive at times, because you know lawyers love to make their points again, and again, and again, and then for really real the fifth time. And of course, I felt the need to track down a number of case law citations, and also check with my previous reporting of events which were now being referenced. Thankfully, almost all my previous reporting reflected the salient points the attorneys referred to in their closing arguments. As the events of day 7 unfolded, and as I unpackaged all the arguments, I got the sense that Carl's case as it was presented has some flaws. Carl's defense should be ironclad based on the known facts of the matter, but as you'll see, a lack of due diligence on the part of Carl's lawyers may have impacted his chances of victory. Meanwhile, while I hate to say it, our protagonist KB made an astonishingly bad mistake, right in the middle of his closing arguments. If Carl's case were any weaker, this one blunder honestly could have single-handedly torpedoed his entire defense. Thankfully, as you'll see, I don't think this particular gaffe will matter in the end. But it did nearly give me a stroke as I watched it live. Meanwhile, my viewing experience was enhanced once again. During the off time, a number of us who had signed up for remote viewing had identified each other. For one thing, we figured out that the link information being sent out was the same for everyone. There was a single link for, day 6, and a single link for, day 7, although those two links were different from each other. Whether this enabled additional folks to watch as well, I don't know. Either way, the peanut gallery now had a live chat going as the closing arguments unfolded, something which was impossible in the electronics free courtroom. And all my regular caveats on these updates, this'll be a bit quick and raw compared to my usual fare. I am not going to reintroduce stuff from my previous, Carl vs. Billy, posts, linked above, so I will assume you've read them. As a reminder though, BB refers to Billy's barrister, and KB refers to Carl's barrister. I'm normally very careful with quotes to make sure they're accurate, but I can usually re-listen to media to confirm. Since these are all one and done, there'll be plenty of times where I capture what I think is the essence of what was said. Anything in regular quotes should be considered word for word. Anything with brackets means not word for word, but conveys the meaning of what was said. And even then, I'm human and can make mistakes. Also, I'm just reporting what was said, without additional fact-checking, nothing should necessarily be taken as fact just because someone said it here. You, you may be wondering how I got here. So there I was, sitting at my computer, typing and screencapping and linking furiously to get the day 6 right up out before. The start of the day 7 hearing. I was pounding that keyboard harder than I had this entire time, except maybe when trying to keep up with Elliot Watkins' testimony. I had three hours to go. Then I had two hours to go. Then it was one hour. Then it was a half hour. Getting frequent DMs and tags, when's day six coming? Just needed more work, more time, a little more work, a little more time, just a little more. I was doing final layout when I saw Judge appeared on the stream in the other window. But there was no audio? I checked, and everything was fine on my end. No audio means, no notes. 
So I kept firing away. The camera was fixed on the judge, who appeared to be just sitting there. I didn't know, had the proceeding even started? Were they just waiting for someone? I went through my final proofreading pass on day 6, which ended up being a bit shoddy, lol, and I finally hit that publish button. And it was literally less than one whole second of margin between doing that, and the audio of the proceeding coming up. It was that narrowly under the wire. So I immediately swapped over to my notepad, and got to work. I learned later that the proceeding had started on time, but that the first few minutes were on mute, as indicated by a crossed red microphone others saw but I didn't. For this reason, I missed whatever remarks began the day. And thankfully, the clerk caught this before allowing hours of remarks to go inaudible. Afterward, I did check with someone who had attended in person, to get an idea what I had missed. Apparently, KB entered a submission the court explaining why Jace Hall was unable to testify. This sort of thing can be important, because otherwise, a negative inference could be drawn from his absence. In other words, without KB's explanation, judge could assume there was a reason Jace did not testify, and that this reason could reflect poorly on the defense. Reportedly, BB accepted this and didn't intend to suggest any negative inference from Jace's absence, and so the judge did not intend to either. It was noted that, moist CR 1T call, Charlie was called in Jace's place. Reportedly, the fact that Billy's wife Evelyn did not testify was brought up as well. You may recall Evelyn as the inflatable flotation buoy seen way back in, King of Kong, dot. KB noted that a negative inference could be drawn from that, given that she'd be a key witness to a number of circumstances and events. This topic gets brought up again later, and each time this, negative inference, was given some legalese name, possibly Latin or possibly based on Australian precedent, which I as the note-taker was unfamiliar with. Following that, KB got into his closing presentation. I'm not sure exactly what preceded this, but the first audible comment on stream was from the judge, remarking that Billy could testify about whether he felt anxious, or depressed, and that he did give such testimony. Judge added that this testimony would be most relevant toward the perceived harm Billy had incurred. KB countered that, while that's true, in this case that's Billy's entire claim of damages, adding that defamation cases generally involve economic losses as a much more significant factor. Judge noted, there's no economic loss claimed in this proceeding. Hey, so far, so good. KB continued that, while some testimony flirted with the idea of economic loss, and that the pleadings do refer to economic loss, there is ultimately no claim for economic loss. KB called this, significant, indicating his intention to circle back around to the bits that he said, flirt, with that line. KB suggested Billy was, stuck with, his feelings as the basis for his claim, to which judge countered that damage to Billy's reputation is on the table as well, adding, as I understand it, the loss of work offered to him, jobs being withdrawn was given as evidence of damage to his reputation, and that he suffered economic damages as a result. KB offered that is indeed the way Billy's evidence has to be applied, because there is no economic loss claimed, with the judge offering he didn't understand Billy to be using it any other way, given the pleading in the plaintiff's written submission, claims no economic loss. As an aside, I wish I could have heard what led up to this exchange. I take it, written submission, refers to the written version of Billy's closing arguments, which had to be turned in the day before this hearing. Yes, Billy did claim all sorts of losses from cancelled convention appearances and such, but if it's not outlined in his pleading in his closing arguments, and if other necessary foundation for these claims had not been established, such as properly connecting those cancellations to Carl's video, then the connection can't be argued to the court. Meanwhile, as the proceeding went on, it seemed as though KB may have been in the midst of his closing arguments, and not some interjection interrupting BB's presentation. I was curious why Carl's side seemed to be conducting their closing arguments first, as I'm accustomed to the defense typically going last. KB continued noting that no financial documentation had been produced or disclosed. Judge remarked this was probably because he's not claiming financial loss. KB noted additionally that no paperwork was provided demonstrating any paid celebrity appearances by Billy. Judge asked KB if he questioned Billy about the extent of his paid appearances before and after Carl's video, to which KB said he did, adding that the final exchange of his cross-examination dealt with a particular appearance which happened after Jobst's video. KB recalled that Billy claimed over and over that he was not paid for an appearance at that particular show, and that he, just dropped by to see some friends. KB noted he cross-examined Billy, at length, about this, before producing an invoice contradicting Billy's entire story, noting that this goes toward the issue of credit, credibility, as noted in KB's written arguments. Judge circled back, asking if KB had cross-examined Billy as to whether he appeared as a paid celebrity guest at 15 to 25 events before Carl's video. KB said he did not focus on that point as much as Billy's appearances after that video. 
Judge remarked this meant there was uncontested testimony from Billy regarding those earlier appearances, which Judge added, if I were to accept it, would be the evidence before me. Judge added that this depended on whether or not he found that Billy's evidence was so lacking in credit that it couldn't be accepted unless it's corroborated, while acknowledging that KB is arguing that's the case. KB then drew the judge's attention to a certain paragraph referring to a video, identified a moment later as the Guinness video, noting that this video was not entered into evidence and was not pleaded. It was at this point that I gathered that KB may not have been into his own closing arguments exactly, but was in the process of nitpicking and objecting to BB's written submission, but again, without the introductory framing of the hearing, it was hard to be sure. Judge advised that, if there was no objection raised when this media was first referenced, then it's too late to render a pleading objection. Judge did note that the video seemed to be implicated only by way of a reference in a concerns notice. KB responded that this notice introduces claims about the content of that video, including that Carl's statements in the video are grossly defamatory, which KB argued is different than a mere reference. Judge con continued by reading that notices characterizations of Carl's video, including that Guinness World Records is a scam and that their decision to reinstate the scores of a proven cheater, adding that the imputation of the video, according to this notice, was that Guinness had been paid off to reinstate Billy's scores. Judge went on to clarify that this is evidence of an assertion that those things were said in the video, and not actual proof of such. Thus, if BB worded it a particular way, this assertion couldn't be objected to. Judge continued that this, and a lot of the evidence presented, goes to the backstory on Billy's reputation and relationship with Jobs and others, adding that the concerns notice could be considered direct evidence by someone who watched the video. KB countered that this actually supports one of his client's contentions, that Billy uses litigation to get his way. It was around this time the clerk remembered there are multiple cameras in the room, and that we can see the barrister's bench and don't have to stay locked on judge cam. KB moved on to a paragraph referring to Apollo Legends, goodbye, video, and the assertion that Apollo attributed no blame to Billy for his decision. After emphasizing, this is an important point, KB directed the judge's attention to an exhibit in their trial bundle, which turned out to be the settlement between Apollo and Billy. KB continued that, on page 3 of 14, there was a non-disparagement clause where Apollo agreed to permanently cease making content that in any way involve or reference Billy or members of his family or his score claims. KB noted that Judge asked about this very point during the proceedings, before pointing to another clause on the next page, establishing that if Apollo made any such content, he would be in breach of the agreement and would have to pay liquidated damages of $25,000 per violation. KB added that, in Apollo's goodbye video, he spoke at length about how worried he was that his tax debt would burden his family and or estate. Thus, KB argued, of course he didn't mention Mr. Smith in that video, because Apollo knew this would trigger damages that would add to that burden. I'm pretty sure KB did say, Mr. Smith, when he obviously meant, Mr. Mitchell, dot. Judge asked KB to clarify his assertion, that one should not infer from the absence of such a reference to Billy as evidence the legal battle and settlement did not affect Apollo's decision. KB continued that, even though the clause is labeled, non-disparagement, it goes well beyond, non-disparagement, forbidding Apollo from even mentioning Billy's name. Judge noted that an exception could be made with Billy's consent, and that Billy did give such consent to the initial statement Apollo published. The OWN Goal And here's where we get to KB's gargantuan mistake. See if you can spot it as it unfolds. Continuing with his apparent dissection of BB's submission, KB pointed to a paragraph relating to, aggravated damages. The paragraph refers to a tweet by Carl to the effect that, if Billy provides evidence to the contrary of the statements in Carl's video, Carl would make a public statement about it. KB noted that this goes to Carl's willingness to change his publication. KB added that he intends to come back to the subject of aggravated damages later, but that he's attempting to follow the written submissions as he goes. Okay, so far so good, right? The judge, confused for a moment, then asked for a clarification on the timeline. Judge noted that Carl had taken the words down, then put them back up, then taken them back down again, adding that he didn't offhand recall the days each of these happened. KB noted this gets made more confusing by the date difference, and how that affects the timestamps on some of the documents. Judge then tried to nail down the timeline, based on some paperwork in front of him. Carl put the words up on the 26th of May, then took them down on the 4th of June, and told Keemstar that day he had done so, based on Keemstar's word. KB then notes Carl's claim to Keemstar that he would make a statement if the words are proven wrong. Judge then cites Carl as saying, if nothing concrete comes up, he would just leave the video as is. But then, Judge notes, Carl did get a note from Apollo's brother that Apollo didn't give Billy any money. And he put the words back up anyway, didn't he? Obviously, the timeline is a bit mixed up here. But that's fine. No problem. 
Judge was a little confused on the sequence of events. It's understandable, there's a lot to go over. But it's all there. Just politely correct his honor, before it gets out of hand. Instead, KB agrees with the incorrect timeline. He agrees that Carl put the words back up for a few days, before taking them down again. Which is true, but which happened before Carl spoke to Apollo's brother. Judge said these actions were inconsistent with what Carl said to Keemstar. KB said, to a degree. Judge countered, with emphasis, completely. KB replied that it's not completely incongruent, because Carl said he would make a statement about it, and he... Judge responded, but he didn't leave the version with the words edited out. To the contrary, having been told the video was wrong, he put it back up again. Again. KB awkwardly answered, for a number of days, I accept that. KB then adds that Carl did ultimately go on to make a statement about it. Some of us in the chat started to get concerned. Surely KB knows the most important sequence of events in this case, doesn't he? Is he going to come around and get this corrected? After some silence, Judge asked KB if it's his submission that Carl's message to Keemstar is proof of Carl's bona fides and his willingness to either correct the video upon demonstration that the claim was mistaken, or at least leave the words out if it was unclear whether they were correct. In the same breath, Judge suggested this question of Carl's good faith could affect claims of aggravated damages. KB then pointed out that much was made during Carl's cross-examination about whether Billy's concerns notice constituted contact from Billy directly, adding that the judge also asked Carl questions about this point directly. KB said, within the legal sphere, they all understand that an attorney making contact on someone's behalf is direct contact, noting that Carl's explanation was simply that it was not Billy personally contacting him. KB continued that while there may not be a difference to us lawyers, there is a difference, including in circumstances where there's another third party like Keemstar mediating between the parties. After another silence, Judge remarked that, if he understands Carl's stance correctly, he wasn't prepared to accept whatever Billy's lawyer said, on Billy's instructions, because Billy didn't directly contact him to say it himself. Judge remarked this was a very fine distinction that most people would not make. KB recalled again to the fact there was an additional third party who was trusted by both sides, who was negotiating. Judge disputed the characterization that Keemstar was negotiating, rather than was simply a conduit for messages. Judge then reiterated, and you can hear Judge's volume raise a little as he spelled this out, an agent for Mr. Mitchell told him what he said was wrong. Mr. Mitchell didn't get paid anything. And in reliance on that, Mr. Jobs took down the offending words, and said he would check with Apollo Legend's brother. Having checked with Apollo's brother, he then put back up the offending words, which were inconsistent with what he had been told by the brother, and inconsistent with what he had been told by Keemstar, and inconsistent with what he was told by Mr. Mitchell's lawyers, on Mr. Mitchell's direct instructions. So he had three sources saying the words were wrong, but he put the material back up again anyway. That's relevant to his bona fides and whether there would be aggravated damages, if there are damages at all. At this point, I started to panic. This was completely wrong. And this incorrect timeline paints Carl as some malicious actor who intended to tell lies. Obviously, there's the worry that the judge himself was so badly misinformed, but I'm sure he was always planning to carefully go over the evidence before rendering a verdict. More urgently, I thought, KB has to correct this. It's his job to advocate for his client. The judge is, in a way, relying on KB to make that case, so judge doesn't have to do it all himself. Instead, KB just sorta of moves on. He said, it is relevant, along with other things, like the apology video, drawing a bit of an eye roll from the judge. Then KB went back to talking about the concerns notice again. I wanted to fucking scream at my computer. How do you, as Carl's barrister, possibly mess up this timeline that badly? These are basic, essential facts about this case. It would be like a defense counsel at a bank robbery trial remarking, well, you know, my client probably did rob that bank, but I'd rather talk about something else. What? The? Fuck. It's probably a good thing I wasn't physically in the courtroom. During that sequence, I would have been emphatically shaking my head whispering, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. And when KB just accepted it and moved on, I probably would have gotten up and ran over to Carl's solicitor and grabbed his shoulder and whispered. What the hell? None of that's true. You gotta get in there and get him to correct that. What is he paying you for? Granted, I don't understand what powers an Australian solicitor has to insert corrections such as these in the middle of a hearing, nor do I know what ability the barrister has to pause his arguments and take instructions from his colleagues. But in that moment, knowing Carl absolutely cannot make a scene himself, I would have happily sacrificed my ability to attend the rest of the hearing to make sure this colossal error was corrected before it went any further. 
However, as a distant bystander thousands of miles away, all I could do was watch the train wreck unfold. Meanwhile, I checked our chat during the moments of silence, and things weren't going any better there. I was getting DMs from people who were equally astonished, freaking out and asking how this could be happening. Oh, and while I can't speak for Carl, who was sitting in that courtroom, you know he couldn't be happy about this either, since he knows the actual timeline as well as anyone. Granted, on the whole, Carl's case was so robust, and Billy had failed to establish pretty much anything he needed to, that there was still a good deal of confidence in the belief that justice will eventually win out in the end. But for the first time, I began to feel actual tension and doubt as to the possibility that, if such errors compounded, this could all go completely off the rails. After pointing back to the concern's notice, Judge again cited its claim that Apollo didn't have to pay Billy any money in damages or costs, which Carl was told by Keemstar and subsequently by Apollo's brother. KB said the notice also referred to Carl's claim that Billy's lawsuit against Apollo was meritless, which Judge noted was an opinion. KB continued to another paragraph, dealing with three bits of legal opinion on whether a publication is defamatory. One of those defined defamation as anything that causes one to be shunned or avoided without any moral discredit on their part. KB noted that the evidence going to whether Billy was shunned and avoided would be important to the judge's decision. At this point, I saw Carl's solicitor Sam Barber appear in frame, sitting down to talk to KB's assistant. I don't think I ever did catch her name. I was hoping this exchange was about concern over the incorrect timeline, perhaps prompted by Carl himself, and that it would lead to an impending correction on the record. But as Sam and the assistant had their little sidebar, KB continued. KB referred to Billy's testimony that people still approached him at events after Carl's video. Note that in Australian court, they refer to personal testimony as evidence, but I'm calling it testimony to differentiate it from documentary evidence. KB then asked Judge to recall Billy's specific word, that these people were inquisitive, emphasizing that these people were not shunning him. KB then noted that his cross-examination of Billy focused on these interactions after the video, saying that while COVID has to be considered as a factor, Billy still appeared at many events. Judge then asked whether the characterization was many or several, noting Billy's claim that he was invited to 20 to 25 per year prior to the video and fewer after that. KB could not recall whether in his submission he used the word many or several, which drew a stern rebuke from the judge to the effect that there's a big difference between the two. Judge then remarked, I expect you to make submissions that are accurate based on the evidence. Admittedly, in that moment, I couldn't have told you whether many or several was the greater quantity. But Judge then clarified that, in his opinion, the 20 to 25 figure would constitute many, and a lower number would be closer to several, adding that he considers it a clear distinction. KB continued, recalling having asked Billy about a total of 15 appearances between July 2021 and August 2024. KB noted he asked Billy about social media advertising for some of these, but that Billy could not recall specifics, citing his wife and son as operating his social media accounts. KB then noted that Junior was asked similar questions, and that Junior referred to his mother as having conducted most of that work. KB also recalled asking Billy about whether these appearances were paid or included booths. Judge asked if KB was submitting this as proof Billy was not shunned and avoided. KB noted that it was still within at least some definition of the word many, particularly given COVID. Judge advised caution in regard to any effects of COVID, given Carl's video was in May 2021, and that the US was not known for the kind of extended lockdown seen in Australia. KB noted that Billy's testimony also related to international events, as does the total of event appearances by Billy after Carl's video, noting in particular an appearance by Billy in the United Kingdom. KB then circled back to the point that people were still attending Billy's events and being inquisitive, and that invitations were still being sent to him, is not being shunned. KB then pointed out, the difficulty with Billy's testimony about his event appearances, such as that he attended 20 events a year before Carl's video, was that Billy often didn't have a clear recollection of these events until KB asked about them, and that even then Billy would often not have a clear recollection of what occurred. KB then suggested this raised questions about the credibility of those answers. Judge asked if this argument was based on the fact Billy could remember some but not others, but KB clarified the issue that Billy had a good memory of events before the video, but not of the events afterward. Judge summarized KB's position that the court should not consider Billy to be forthright about what happened at events after the video. KB agreed, asking Judge to also consider doing a comparison between the transcripts of the different days of Billy's testimony. KB moved on to more of BB's written submission, asking the judge to read a certain paragraph to himself. One of the issues with Day 7 was, some bits like this relied on silent readings or references to paragraphs which I have no access to. 
However, according to KB, Billy's side appeared to be arguing that an imputation of a publication can be assisted by comments others make on that publication, and yet KB said this could contradict some of BB's earlier testimony objections. KB then noted that some of the comments included as an exhibit were never demonstrated to have come from people who actually watched the video. Judge asked how this was made an exhibit, and KB was unsure, but asserted that these comments can't be used as evidence in this way. Judge then asked if any of these comments came from the 10,000 comments KB himself tendered, but KB noted those batches were from one of the witnesses' videos. That would be Charlie. KB understood these contested comments to be replies to Carl's video, while noting a similar objection that BB was cherry-picking the few comments which relate to this or that without submitting the entirety of those comments. Judge then summarized KB's position, that the court shouldn't consider the contested paragraph to be proven by these comments. Judge did note that, insofar as any value could be derived from these comments, they should be considered from the perspective of an ordinary and reasonable viewer, but that there's a possible absence of evidence that these are ordinary and reasonable viewers. Judge then remarked, some of the people who make these comments may be reasonable, but that depends on the community where the comments are made, adding, it seems people in the gaming community, or the broader online community, consider what's reasonable to be something very different to people standing on the train. KB noted that witnesses on both sides referred to the gaming community as taking certain things more seriously than the general population would, adding that this community views certain allegations such as cheating very differently to how, your honor and I as non-gamers, would. KB then made another cryptic response to another paragraph and exhibit, saying he would lodge a similar objection to that. KB then pointed to a paragraph where BB argued that Carl's video lowered Billy's reputation in society generally. To that point, KB declared, I'm unaware of any evidence to that effect, either for or against my client's position. Judge countered that many people in society are interested in gaming, and that members of this subset could be said to simply be members of society in general. KB agreeably laughed and acknowledged he of course wouldn't argue that gamers weren't members of society generally, adding that they belong to a subculture. However, KB argued, the pleading did not refer to the viewpoint of this subculture in that way, but rather to Billy's reputation in society generally. KB asserted that most or all of the evidence focused on Billy's reputation within that subculture. Judge responded by asking about Guinness World Records, characterizing it as a publication referred to by many people across society. However, Judge did interrupt himself to say that's probably irrelevant, since the matter deals with Carl's video, which would have only been viewed within the given gaming subculture. KB then said he would take it a step further, citing some case law regarding social media posts. As KB argued, they're dealing with a 20-minute video, where the offending words were near the end, rhetorically asking if society generally watches a 20-minute video of this type all the way through. Judge retorted that anyone interested in Billy Mitchell or Arcade Donkey Kong and allegations of cheating would watch it all the way through because they're interested in the subject matter, adding that 20 minutes is not that long. Judge noted they may skip through if they're not interested in the first gentleman, whose name he could not recall, to which KB pointed out some others may only be interested in the first gentleman and not Billy. At that point, Judge mused that it's probably unlikely that anyone interested in one would not be interested in the other, but that it's possible given the different games involved. Regardless, Judge held the perspective that anyone interested in Billy would watch the whole thing, unless the video was so long and repetitive they would get bored, but didn't consider that true of Carl's video. KB respectfully maintained his submission that 20 minutes is a long time, adding that there was no expert testimony to the ability of YouTube viewers to maintain attention for that long. Judge did note there was evidence that a lot of people did see that part of the video, from the comments if nothing else. KB then noted this ties into his objection, that the types of things said in the beginning of the video are all about cheating, and thus if the totality of the comments demonstrated a focus on cheating, then the court could infer that those people didn't watch the video all the way through or that viewers were primarily interested in the cheating, adding that the absence of these comments in evidence creates some difficulty. At this point, we on the remote stream heard from Billy's barrister for the first time that day. BB asked to correct an error in his written submission, directing Judge to a certain paragraph. BB clarified that a witness speaking to a plaintiff's reputation need not know the plaintiff, with the emphasis being that the word not had been missing. BB noted this was a pretty critical error, lol. BB and KB had a quick huddle, and KB accepted this obvious correction. As to why this random correction was lodged at this time, KB then remarked that BB had seen the red highlighting on KB's copy and thus knew this question would be raised soon. Hey, at least someone knew how to make a timely correction. KB still raised a dispute with the latter part of the given paragraph, making the point that Billy's witnesses all still had high respect for Billy following the video. KB argued some of those witnesses didn't believe the claim, while quoting one witness as saying, haters will hate, and explaining to the judge what the expression means. 
These witnesses all still liked Billy and wanted to go with him to exhibitions and to be seen with him, adding that one witness in particular had no qualms about recommending Billy to other event organizers. Judge asked if it was also their testimony that people come to events specifically to see Billy, while pondering the distinction between these event organizers' opinions of Billy remaining unchanged and the opinion of the gaming community at large remaining unchanged. KB remarked that even one of Carl's witnesses, Jimmy Nails, said all publicity is good publicity, and that people come whether they hate Billy or love him, reiterating that this is not being shunned. Judge then summarized KB's argument, which was that Billy's reputation was not meaningfully damaged by Carl's video, to which KB added that Billy's reputation from prior to Carl's video has remained unchanged. KB also noted that he asked each of his witnesses about Billy's reputation at various points in time. KB then brought up Billy's previous litigations over the cheating scandal and such, and the suggestion from Billy and his son that those had little to no impact on Billy's feelings or reputation. KB asserted, in my respectful submission, this cannot be accepted. It cannot be accepted. KB then requested judge pay attention to the pleadings in those other cases, and the way in which they allege damage from those publications. Judge recalled KB elicited testimony to this end with regard to the Twin Galaxies lawsuit. KB said his submission addresses that point, calling it, extremely important. Judge noted those pleadings are just allegations, and not evidence of the harm caused to Billy. KB started to illustrate a hypothetical scenario of offering contradictory claims of damages to different courts, before Judge interrupted to say, these claims may affect Billy's credibility, but they're still just allegations, and thus are not proof that Billy's reputation had been affected by those earlier controversies. KB noted that the court still should not accept Billy's position on this because of the issue of credibility, to which Judge said he understood. I was still a bit unclear of the structure of what was going on, whether KB would be making proactive oral arguments, or whether he already had, or whether these, closing arguments, consisted entirely of tearing apart the other party's written submission. But it was around this point I accepted that KB's earlier pledge of keeping his closing short would likely not result in a shorter, day 7. Note that while it may feel the judge was nitpicking and scrutinizing Carl's side during KB's arguments, that sort of thing is standard procedure. His job is to keep his cards close, and to be a bit of a hard ass on each side, and pick apart what they're trying to slip into the record. I told folks in our chat, this is to be expected and isn't a cause for concern, unless judge didn't have the same sort of scrutiny when it came time for BB's arguments later. KB moved on to another passage, noting that it also conflicted with Billy maintaining a position that the earlier scandals and litigations had no impact on him. Again, the passage in question was identified by paragraph number, but was not elaborated on vocally. KB recalled putting to Junior that one does not engage a public relations firm to proactively mend someone's reputation if they don't believe that reputation was damaged at that point in time. KB noted that his proposition was not accepted, adding that, this does go to credit, in my respectful submission. In plain English, if Junior can't admit the contradiction, then how can his testimony be believed? After a lengthy silence, KB appeared to accept the judge's lack of rebuttal, and moved on to his next topic. With regard to the previous proceedings, KB said the alleged defamations in those cases were published in places like Variety and the Washington Post. Thus, as KB pointed out, those legal claims argued that the statements were spread by way of large media publications. Judge asked KB to confirm his point was that Billy's reputation must have been affected in society generally by those widely distributed media outlets. KB concurred, continuing with his illustration of Billy coming to Australia and arguing those things did not affect his reputation, despite Billy's earlier pleadings in other lawsuits that those publications caused him significant harm, with Billy now arguing that any effects to his reputation result strictly from Jobst's videos. Judge noted that, relevant to this proceeding, Carl's video made a different sort of allegation, not that he was a cheater but that he had contributed towards someone committing suicide, adding that these could be considered separate damage and that one could be considered greater than the other. At this time, Judge asked if KB was making this point primarily toward Billy's credibility, and KB indicated he was. But Judge added that the argument was also being made that Billy's reputation was so poor from the cheating allegations that something like this wouldn't have harmed him significantly if at all either way. KB agreed, and also agreed with Judge that those were different points being made. KB said the submission from his learned friend then goes through each witness, adding that he'd first like to address testimony from Walter Day. KB noted that Walter offered no testimony that Billy's popularity has declined. Judge asked if BB claimed otherwise, to which KB said BB did not, but that it's an important point. KB moved on to testimony from Preston Burt, noting that Preston also testified that Billy still has a good reputation, and that Preston himself still likes Billy. KB added that Mr. Burt said he hasn't even heard of Carl's video. Note that this was not reflected in my day 4 notes. 
KB continued to say Burt testified that he wouldn't hesitate to have Billy back to another exhibition, and would recommend him to other organizers. Judge concurred with another, yes, followed by more affirmative silence. KB then read the relevant passages from the transcripts to both of those points. KB continued to say, the witness was shown a YouTube podcast during cross-examination, wherein he talks about actively promoting Billy in connection to his event. At this point, Judge remarked that these are actually references to Mr. McNutt and not Preston Burt, to which KB acknowledged his error. Note that I also don't have a reference to Mr. McNutt saying he was unaware of Carl's video. So, apologies, I guess I missed it either way. KB continued describing McNutt's testimony, where he described Billy as, in KB's words, the greatest antagonist, which McNutt accepted under cross-examination was a reference to the controversy. Per KB, McNutt also accepted that Billy was portrayed as the villain of King of Kong, and that his scores had been, wiped out, by Twin Galaxies, adding that McNutt accepted the characterization that any publicity is good publicity. KB then moved on to the testimony from Billy's friend Steve Grunberger. Grunberger and his wife still enjoy spending time with Billy, and aren't shunning him. Judge remarked this may be the case, but asked if Steve gave any testimony about Billy's general reputation, remarking that what Steve felt personally is not that relevant. KB countered that it is relevant to the point of whether Billy was being shunned. Judge said it is relevant that some who liked Billy beforehand still do, but that it's Billy's general reputation that's most important. KB noted that, if it gets to the question of damages, what one's friends and loved ones think is quite important. KB then pointed to further testimony from Grunberger, which was not specified. Judge remarked, as if a response to this passage, that there are many comments and evidence from both sides that indicate that many people do believe what they read or hear on the internet. KB then directed right toward testimony from Isaiah, Triforce, Johnson, who KB said testified from somewhere, remote. Judge joked that Triforce may dispute that he was somewhere, remote, that it may have been, remote, from Australia, but everything's, remote, from Australia. KB reiterated Isaiah's remark that, haters gonna hate, adding that there's been other testimony to the same effect, and that Billy has had people in his corner and not in his corner throughout these controversies. KB noted that Isaiah's testimony seems to contradict Billy's in how the TG dispute did or did not affect Billy, and that this goes to credit once again. KB did make sure to note that Billy's statements from his Twin Galaxies deposition, January 2023, were made well after Carl's video, May 2021. KB also pointed out that Triforce testified he only saw Carl's video because Billy showed it to him, saying this is consistent with KB's own point regarding Billy's treatment of Carl's video. KB asks rhetorically, if Carl's words caused Billy such harm and disgrace, why would Billy republish those words, framing them with, for those of you who haven't seen it, here's the clip. KB continues to paraphrase Billy, these words are so bad, I want more people to see them, adding that this should not sit well with the judge. KB noted Triforce described the same dynamic himself. You haven't seen it, but I'll show it to you. KB then recalled asking Triforce about attending events with Billy, noting that Triforce also thus acknowledged Billy was still being invited to events. KB went into a rhetorical bit here, arguing, just because someone doesn't like you doesn't mean you're going to be shunned, especially someone with fame. KB analogized to Tom Cruise, and the fact people who don't like him will still go to see his movies, or would still get a selfie with him on the street. Thus, KB argued, the relevant imputation isn't whether the publication caused people not to like Billy. Judge replied that it is party so, if a publication causes people's estimation of somebody to go down, referring to BB's submitted definition of defamation. KB countered that that is his point, that just because someone doesn't like a celebrity doesn't mean they'll shun and avoid him. Judge responded, again, that what has been said of someone could cause people to think less of them, which is part of whether a statement is defamatory. Judge continued, hypothetically, I could think, based on what Mr. Jobs said, that Mr. Mitchell is a terrible person who hounds a young man to death. But if Mr. Mitchell's going to a show near me, I may actually go and see him, despite the fact I think he's an awful person. Judge said, as a hypothetical, he may not shun and avoid Billy, but his previous view of Billy as a wonderful person could be changed, and none of that would mean the statements weren't defamatory. KB noted that part of Billy's case is that he's no longer being invited to events, and that when he does attend he's being shunned and avoided by people. Judge said he was unsure Billy had presented evidence or arguments to that exact effect, except that his invitations to events became fewer in general, while noting testimony to the effect that Billy's still a draw card at the events he does attend due to the controversy. Judge concluded by acknowledging KB's point, but asserted he still has to consider the other aspect as well. KB then pointed toward BB's sector of reputation arguments, suggesting that it's the first time that the sector argument has been particularized. 
KB then suggested the relevant sector is the video gaming sector, and that the alleged imputations relate to Billy's conduct in protecting his reputation as a video gamer. KB continued that Billy's lawsuit against Apollo was again about Billy protecting his reputation as a video gamer, and thus as KB argues, Apollo's death has a causal connection to Billy protecting that reputation as a gamer. KB added that the contextual truth imputations also relate to Billy protecting his reputation as a video gamer. Thus, KB argues, the alleged imputation is that Billy does harm as a way of protecting his reputation as a video gamer. KB continued, there's no suggestion in any of these imputations that Billy randomly shot someone. It's the propensity to do harm in an attempt to protect his reputation as a video gamer. KB thus asserted that video gaming is the relevant sector. KB continued to say the contested words from Carl include the statement that Apollo had to remove his videos on Billy's cheating, thus, KB says, there's a causal connection within that sector. KB proceeded to cite another paragraph which refers to an imputation that Billy hounded someone into taking their own life. KB suggested this misrepresented the entirety of it, because Billy's actions were about protecting his video game reputation. KB continued to say, therein lies the entirety of the importance of not only the contested words, but also the video as a whole, because the video goes into detail on the lengths Billy will go to, and the stresses Billy will inflict on others, to protect his reputation as a gamer. You probably noticed by now that no correction to the earlier blunder had arrived. Regardless, KB hadn't lost any of his swagger. I noticed how, through all these arguments, as he stood there orating and taking brief notes with his left hand, he had his right hand partially down some sort of, pouch? I'm not sure how these silly barrister robes work, but this pouch or crease seemed to be only slightly askew of his direct front, lol. It definitely brought back memories of watching Married with Children as a little kid. KB during his off hours, probably. Next level. Moving on, KB said that with regard to contextual truth arguments, he would limit his to what he called the fourth alternative imputation. In plainer English, KB then described this as the imputation that Billy had callously expressed joy at rumors of Apollo's death, noting that this imputation was substantially true. KB explained, the reason he's limiting this argument in this way is because, that is the most damning. Judge first identified the relevant paragraph from the pleading as 17b4, bravo, before correcting it to 17d4, Donkey Kong. KB flatteringly laughed before pointing out where BB's written submission addresses this point. KB noted that it's accepted that Billy sent the offending text messages about Apollo, however Billy's side disputes that Billy callously expressed joy at reports of Apollo's death. BB's filing, according to KB, said Billy was being facetious and making an attempt at humor. KB then drew judges' attention to a couple exhibits in the trial bundle, which were soon identified as those text exchanges between Billy and Carlos, and Billy and Jace. On stream, you could actually see the judge flipping through Carlos' copies thanks to the green background. KB thus argued this wasn't a one-time facetious comment from Billy, nor was it isolated to a single day. KB then directed attention toward the bit from Billy claiming his wife found this Apollo rumor in two places, while pointing out that Billy's testimony was that Reddit is not credible. However, KB posits that this report was apparently found in two different locations online, and thus was not exclusive to Reddit. KB then read from Billy's message to Jace. If it is true I will not shed a tear I will try not to smile or giggle no promises. KB contended that, in his respectful submission, that is not someone being facetious or attempting to be funny. At this point, Judge asked KB if he intended to make an inference on the absence of Billy's wife from the trial, remarking that she could have testified to a number of relevant things. KB agrees, remarking that there are two important such topics, one of which is this exchange about Apollo where she cited. Judge interrupted to say he wasn't inviting KB to make this inference, but was asking because very little mention of Billy's wife had otherwise been made, and that Evelyn was not referenced in KB's written submission. KB indicated he was indeed inviting the court to infer that her testimony would have been relevant, both to this point, and to a lesser extent, Billy's event appearances, since she was reportedly in charge of the family's social media. KB noted Judge will also have to contend with conflicting testimony about the veracity of Reddit, to which Judge said he can't reasonably conclude any such view. After Judge took a moment to recount the days of these text exchanges, KB offered that the beginning of the Carlos exchange could be argued to be facetious, the way someone may say, I haven't heard from him for a while, hope he's not dead, but that exchange does not end that way. KB claimed that, days later, they were still making references to specific though unidentified sources. For what it's worth, days later, is inaccurate, as the actual exchange lasts just a little over one hour, from 11pm to just past midnight. KB also pointed to where Billy said, no joke, positing that one does not say, no joke, as a joke. KB read the further exchange, 
clarifying that OMG is an acronym, before Judge smirkingly explained he is aware that OMG is short for Oh My God, adding that sometimes other letters are added for emphasis. After more flattering laughter, KB emphasized again that Billy was not joking, adding that Carlos testified to that as well during cross-examination. KB read again from Billy's texts that Billy would not shed a tear, and would try his hardest not to smile or giggle. Note that the phrasing sent to Carlos was different to that sent to Jace. KB noted again this is not being facetious. KB then referred to their search for evidence, and how this search also does not indicate facetiousness. KB then read Billy's further remarks. I certainly hope you find something solid. Oops. Was I not supposed to say that? And as KB said, Billy said he'd task his wife with finding it again, reiterating that this is not facetiousness, or in Billy's words, dark humor. KB then pointed to Carlos' remark that he'd keep an eye open, indicating they would continue looking for evidence, and Billy's next remark, you are probably correct, arguing again that this exchange is wholly inconsistent with being a joke. KB offered a contrast to someone saying, you know we're kidding about this, right? Of course you won't find anything solid. Judge noted that Billy did say Carlos was probably correct about it being a troll post, to which KB said that still does not suggest they were joking. KB then referred to the conclusion of the exchange, remarking, the inference is they're going to buy someone a pizza, because they may have been responsible for the death. Judge asked if that last remark could be a joke, given the context of a death by spider troll post. KB acknowledged that portion could be considered a joke on the basis that they could not find any direct evidence, so it was probably not true. KB continued to say, however, that the messages prior to that are problematic, adding that one can joke about it when it's not true, but cannot when they think it is true. KB said Billy tried to explain this as dark humor, contrary to Carlos' testimony. However, KB argued that whatever Billy meant by that is probably not relevant, given this text exchange is in Carl's video. Therefore, it's not about what Billy meant by it, but rather what a reasonable viewer would infer, noting that these are the same sorts of imputations being pleaded by the plaintiff. What would a reasonable person think when they see that up on the screen? Judge did ask which portions of these were shown in Carl's video, to which KB noted it was not the whole exchange. Judge countered that Billy is not complaining about Carl's publication of those messages, but rather what Carl said about them, saying that a viewer seeing and hearing those bits together would be likely to take the view that Billy is the type of person to express joy at a young man's death. KB replied, yes, and it's true. KB then argued that, even if the judge was opposed to all the other defense arguments about the imputations of the video, with the worst imputation would be that Billy contributed to the suicide of Apollo, if judge does arrive at this positive defense of contextual truth, KB submits that it would, undoubtedly, be seen as far more vile and disgusting and evil for Billy to callously take joy in the death of this person. As KB argued, one could contribute to the stress of someone who ultimately takes their own life, but one would not assume that that action was intentional, before reiterating, it is far worse to be accused of taking joy in a young fellow's death, adding that such an act would be intentional. After some silence, Judge offered a, yes. KB then reiterated that this constitutes a defense to Billy's lawsuit. Judge gave it some thought, then remarked that KB is characterizing this as the worst imputation by way of comparison to the other worst imputation. Thus, as Judge summarizes KB's argument, this imputation outweighs all the others, and thus the problem for Billy would be that it could be seen as a true imputation, that he did callously express joy at Apollo's death. Therefore, as Judge continues summarizing KB's argument, it would be a defense to all of Billy's claims of defamation. KB then refers to some case law decision cited in his closing briefs, wherein a plaintiff attempted to argue certain statements were damaging, while ignoring other statements in the same publication which were so much worse, noting the plaintiff could not complain about those worse statements because they were true. KB then reiterated, yet again, that the worse imputation outweighs all the others, and that he can't think of anything worse than suggesting someone takes joy in a young fellow's death. KB continued that, while this analogy is not in his submission, the only imputation he could think of that would compare would be to call a teacher a pedophile. Judge offered that one worse imputation would be if someone consciously and deliberately hounded someone to commit suicide. KB begged to differ, believing that not to be worse, characterizing the taking of joy in someone's death as downright evil, and calling it next level. KB reiterated that, while being called a pedophile would be serious and awful, his submission is that the characterization of someone as taking joy in a person's death is still worse. Note that obviously both are horrific, and that I've only captured summaries of KB's words and not the totality of his presentation. To Judge's point, KB noted there is nothing in Billy's pleading to the effect that Carl accused Billy of any deliberate attempt to push Apollo to suicide. KB added, even if that were the imputation, he submits that taking joy in that, would be even next level worse than that, because that is true evil.
KB then reiterated that, if the judge did arrive at this point, this would be, the end of it. KB then raised the question that, if the judge were still against Carl on each of these points, this matter would still come into play with the question of damages. KB remarked he doesn't understand how Billy's damages could come near what's pleaded. Based on subsequent remarks by the judge, there seems to be codified law regarding the maximum damages in cases like these, which change over time. Judge remarked that, while nobody mentioned it in their submissions, those maximum general damages are in the $430,000 range, but judge could not recall if this legal maximum is based on the date when the proceeding started, or on the date of trial. Judge did note that this maximum was, only available in the very worst of cases. KB offered his opinion that, even if judge found Carl at fault, this wouldn't come close to that threshold. KB then offered a recent decision from this court from a 2023 case titled, Harrington v. Short. According to KB, Harrington did involve an accusation of pedophilia, and the ruling discussed comparisons to other cases which also involved accusations of pedophilia. In those other cases, the publications were far more widespread, and their impact on the plaintiff was much more significant. According to KB, that case also dealt with the grapevine effect, as well as diagnosed conditions such as depression. KB noted the plaintiff was no longer invited to social functions and family gatherings, contrasting with Billy's situation where his friends and family seemed to want him around just as much. KB also noted the decision referenced the health of the plaintiff, acknowledging there is testimony from Billy himself to that end, but that that testimony is affected by difficulties with his credit. To that point, KB recalled the moment in Billy's deposition testimony, which was given after this lawsuit started, where Billy was asked about alleged defamation by Carl Jobst, to which Billy said words to the effect that it was nothing in comparison to the defamation by Twin Galaxies, which was almost word for word the opposite of what he testified here. KB noted that Judge can find those citations in his written submission, and he didn't want to try his honor's patience by reiterating them all orally. KB thus posited, Billy's self-serving testimony should not be accepted without corroboration. KB returned to the Harrington decision, where a plaintiff had to move to a new house because of the rumors, reiterating that that's not the case here, where Billy is still attending events, and still maintaining a presence online. The decision also referred to another plaintiff where an engagement broke down, noting there is no such break of relationships in this proceeding. KB continued, I simply do not understand how those cases, which won relatively small amounts of money, could compare to this matter. KB reiterated that there's no claim for economic loss here. KB then noted that Harrington awarded someone $15,000 for being accused of being a pedophile, to which the judge asked if that included aggravated damages, which KB believed it did not. Judge eventually tracked down in the decision where that judge awarded a small component for aggravated damages due to the extreme allegation, but did not identify what that small component was. KB returned to his argument, noting that the publication in Harrington was obviously more widespread, and that the seriousness of the allegation and impact were far worse. Judge countered that the allegation in this case was more widespread, which KB accepted was true at the beginning. I think this meant, in Harrington, an allegation was transmitted privately, and eventually crossed into larger publications, whereas Carl's contested words began with his publication. Judge noted this meant potential damages could be higher than if it were only sent to half a dozen people, which appeared to be the case in the Harrington examples. KB accepted this, but noted that a small number of people in those cases could still have a significant impact, calling back to the example of a teacher whose allegation was conveyed to their employer or colleagues. One more thing. At this point, KB declared that, unless Judge had any further questions, that was his submissions. However, we weren't at halftime of closing arguments quite yet. Judge reminded KB he was going to address the question of mitigation, to which KB said that's dealt with in his written submission. However, KB began to discuss the topic anyway, noting that there are two important points. KB first made a reference to the limited amount of time the contested words were online, but said more important than that was the apology video. KB noted his impression that Judge appeared troubled by that argument, to which Judge said, I am troubled by the apology video. Judge pointed to KB's written argument, which used Billy's methodology of views equating to people who have watched the totality of the video, and pointed out that Carl's retraction video was seen by twice as many viewers. However, Judge countered, it was not brought to the attention of people who might have an interest in Billy or Apollo or cheating that this video contains information about those subjects. Judge compared this to every other Carl video discussing Billy, which had his face in the thumbnail, while this one focused on a completely different topic. Thus, Judge asked, how could this be seen as an intended apology, aimed at those who saw the original video? Judge continued, people who have interest in Billy and Donkey Kong and the controversy and Apollo legend may have absolutely no interest in the topic of that video. KB answered that, first, that argument assumes people looking for the video would go searching for it. 
However, Judge disputed this, saying that unless they had an interest in speedrunning, or unless they were on Carl's notification list, they might have seen this video existed, but they may not watch it if it didn't interest them, adding that Carl took a video on a completely different topic and put a minute or so at the very end. Judge opined that, at first blush, that's not a bona fide attempt to correct something said in the past. KB said he can't change the name of the video at this point, to which Judge replied he's giving KB the opportunity to submit something to change his first blush impression. KB answered that testimony had been given to how many subscribers Carl has, noting that those who saw the first video still remain subscribers. Thus, whether the video has Billy's name in it wouldn't affect the video going to those millions of subscribers. Judge countered that it would affect who saw the video and the retraction, illustrating that people primarily interested in speedrunning may see the bit at the end, ask what it's about, and search for the previous video, or may ignore it if it has no interest to them, whereas those who are interested in the Billy story, or in cheating at arcade games generally, would have an interest in this video if they knew it was about Billy, except it does not convey that fact. KB accepted that the video doesn't name Billy, or include a picture of him, and that there's little else he could say that he hasn't said already. Judge added his impression that one can add a comment to a YouTube video that appears along with it, a written introductory comment that one sees when clicking on the video, and that one would expect Carl to use one saying the video deals with Billy. KB added, assuming people read that, to which Judge said it could give people an idea of what's coming. Judge then reiterated that, at first blush, it didn't appear to be a bona fide attempt at a correction. KB attempted to dispute the plaintiff making this argument, to which Judge responded that he's not talking about Billy's complaint but rather KB's assertion that this is a good faith correction to be taken into consideration as mitigating damages. KB replied, his submission is that millions of people watched that correction video, meaning if they watched all the way through, millions watched that correction. KB noted there's a difference between an apology and a correction, saying it's an issue of substance versus form, adding, at its lowest it's a correction, at its highest, it's an apology. Judge noted that it was not an apology to Billy, recalling Carl's answer to his own question to that end. KB recalled Carl's answer to that question being, not specifically. Judge asked, but it's not an apology to Mr. Mitchell, is it? It's an apology to his viewers for giving false information. KB noted it's safe to say Billy was among those who watched it. KB, knowing this could be a weak point in his client's case, drew the attention away and toward a flaw in the oppositions. He pointed out that Billy didn't himself put out a video based on this correction on his own platform. The thing I'm grappling with is that Mr. Mitchell brings this proceeding about how bad these words are, and reproduces them in their entirety, and only the offending words, and leaves it online forever. Judge summarized KB's position that any harm caused to Billy would have stopped long ago had Billy not put those words up on his own YouTube channel, and so the argument goes, the harm was exacerbated in that way. KB agreed, emphasizing that portions of Carl's video, such as that Carl is specifically not calling Billy a murderer are, untouched, whereas only the offending words are left for the world to see, adding that this makes no sense. KB added that this can't be blamed on the grapevine effect, noting also that the only place the word, murder, ever appears is in Billy's own video, and not in Carl's. After a lengthy silence, Judge said he wanted to go through some questions on KB's written filing before he sits down. Judge noted the claim in the written submission that YouTube analytics don't show how many people actually watched and comprehended the contested words. However, Judge remarked, he can infer based on testimony that many if not most who watched it did those things. KB noted this inference would gain strength depending on the number of replies the video received relating to aspects discussed toward the end. While I don't think KB made this point explicitly, basically the argument is that Billy's side could have demonstrated this by submitting the entirety of that video's replies, but they did not. KB also noted that this argument cuts both ways, because it applies to Carl's apology video as well. Judge pondered, had the comments been entered into evidence, if they would demonstrate that many people had seen that part of the video, to which KB said he wouldn't say it was, many. Judge remarked that, in absence of those direct replies, the only such comments in evidence are from the 10,000 kilobytes successfully submitted. I was unclear if Judge thought those were replies to Carl's video as opposed to two videos by Charlie. I'm not sure if that was corrected. Judge moved on to another passage from KB's filing, noting that he must consider the perspective of the ordinary reasonable reader. Judge remarked that, ordinarily, the ordinary reasonable reader is someone from society in general, pondering whether he should limit that perspective to an ordinary YouTube viewer, or to a YouTube viewer whose interest is limited to gaming or cheating, who may not be reasonable in many respects, as indicated by many of the comments on YouTube. Judge then asked rhetorically whether he should limit that scope in that way, even if he doesn't find that subset of people to be reasonable, or whether he should consider it from the perspective of an ordinary person on the omnibus or Gold Coast train. K 
KB referred to a decision in Rhodes, which dealt with such matters on social media, Facebook in particular, arguing that the context of the forum is that important. Judge then offered that he should thus consider this from the perspective of someone who would view the video. KB noted also that YouTube is a conversational forum where people make comments and replies and replies to replies, adding also that the ordinary viewer accepts that YouTube is a sensational forum where people say crazy things. KB added, the example of that, which I'm loath to bring up, was when one of my client's witnesses saw a YouTube clip of him doing things I don't have to repeat here. At first I was like, WTF is he talking about, before I remembered, oh yeah, the fart, LMAO. KB then emphasized that while that content may not be our cup of tea, that is the type of forum YouTube is, adding that it's very different to reading something on the front page of the New York Times. Judge asked about another passage dealing with the words, and, and, but, in relation to Carl's statement. For reference, here's the statement in question. He was forced to remove all of his videos about Mitchell's cheating, and paid him a large sum of money. This left him deeply in debt, which required him to find extra work. But with his ongoing health issues, this was all too much of a burden, and he ultimately took his own life. Judge argued that a viewer would not parse a sentence in the way KB is arguing in his written submission, that they would instead just hear the whole thing. KB argued there's no black and white answer for Judge to consider, adding that he was making a point about the meaning of the literal construction of the words. Judge countered again that the viewer isn't going to hear them in the way KB is arguing before forming an opinion on them. KB maintained his submission, that a viewer will hear what the words mean, adding, when one hears the offending words, in my submission, people understand them to mean not the imputations being pleaded, but what I've put in those paragraphs. Judge then took issue with a certain paragraph, where KB says the word, and, connects Apollo's health issues and his decision to take his own life, and doesn't connect the start of the sentence about, this, leaving Apollo deeply in debt. Judge argued that, and, in his view connects the end clause with, this was all too much of a burden, adding that, this, would refer to the health issues and the financial troubles, thus that each contributed to Apollo's decision. Judge asked if this was the only way that sentence could be construed, to which KB argued that is one way in which it could be construed, adding that at the end of the words there is a further reference to Apollo's health issues, which KB then read from. He was extremely ill and couldn't handle the ongoing stress. KB submitted that this clause brings the focus back to Apollo's illness. Judge parsed it to say that, because of Apollo's illness, he couldn't handle the stress from owing lots of money, being deeply in debt, and being unable to work. KB acknowledged that's one way the statement could be viewed, adding that all of these factors are relevant, and can be interpreted in different ways with slight variations. Judge noted another passage from KB arguing that, given where the context of the contested words in the video, an ordinary reasonable viewer would likely not assign any importance to them, asking why this would be. KB argued that, in addition to the biggest con men title making no reference to the claim, the most important aspects of a video in that forum would be at the beginning. Judge asked why that would be, to which KB said people don't necessarily watch until the end, while readily admitting the same could be said of the apology video. Judge discussed another passage dealing with YouTube comments blaming Billy for Apollo's death, asking if he should interpret those commenters as unreasonable viewers. KB mused it would be helpful to KB's case if Judge did that, before putting forth the argument that it depends on the words being used. KB continued to say that if the comment were extraordinary, Judge should not infer they were a reasonable viewer. Judge remarked that comment saying, he killed Apollo, and, Apollo's life was taken from him by this despicable liar, would be straightforward. KB interjected that that is an unreasonable comment to any interpretation of Carl's words, adding, those words can't be construed such that my client is saying that Mr. Mitchell killed Mr. Smith. They just can't. Judge asked about a comment such as, Mr. Mitchell sued this man into oblivion and caused him to take his own life, adding that the chosen commenters have construed Carl's words such that Billy's actions were a contributing cause for Apollo's decision, noting that these commenters are ignoring the other stated factors. KB added that there is evidence that many watching these videos are attached to the story and are watching all the videos, citing testimony from witnesses that they'll research the topic further to form their opinions, and wouldn't form an opinion from what one person says in one video. Thus, KB argues, there is a basis for believing these commenters are basing their views on multiple sources. Therefore, a commenter saying something that aligns with one of the alleged imputations does not necessarily imply a connection to Carl's video, as opposed to a view they formed independently. Judge noted KB omitted a paragraph citation. KB audibly groaned at his mistake, attempted briefly to look it up, and then asked if he could come back to it. Meanwhile, BB and Billy solicitor Francis could be seen shifting around in their seats, appearing eager for their turn to start. Judge moved to another paragraph arguing that Billy's reputation was that he would ostracize anyone he considered a threat to his Donkey Kong records. 
Judge asked if this settled reputation was based only on the movie, King of Kong. KB noted that's the way it's pleaded and that he is held to his pleading. Judge referred to a passage dealing with the replies to Charlie's videos, asking if they were pleaded and if pleading was necessary. KB replied that it's evidence and not, material fact, and that it came out in the course of the trial and therefore did not need to be pleaded. Judge noted some citations to particular comments, including those few tendered by BB, arguing that damage from those comments isn't consistent with the grapevine effect. Judge countered by asking why they wouldn't be illustrative of the grapevine effect, noting that people were still attributing Apollo's death to Billy years after Carl's video. KB posited that those impressions may come from Billy's video, which remains online, pointing out that Carl's video which remains no longer contains the offending words. Thus, KB argues, such comments arise from the imputations of words presently in Carl's video, not from words which were originally there. Judge pointed out these were not replies to Carl's video, but to Charlie's video which, Judge summarized, characterized Billy as a cheater and someone who bullies those he perceives as weaker. Judge then discussed the video's imputation that Billy planned to create a video as fraudulent evidence of a Donkey Kong score, adding that KB simply asserts this imputation was true. Judge then asked what, in the presented evidence, substantiates this as true. KB cited the transcript of the recorded phone call discussed in the video. KB did note that this isn't a key point for his client, but that he's not abandoning it either. Judge asked about a claim that Twin Galaxies published a statement accusing Billy of cheating, asking if such a statement was in evidence. KB took a long moment to look through his notes, identifying an article entered as an exhibit before correcting himself that the given article deals with Apollo. Judge remarked that there's been a lot of hearsay testimony about documents, such as references to this Twin Galaxy statement, noting that these are just opinions of what the statement said. KB noted it may be correct that the statement is not in evidence, but that it was acknowledged during Billy's examination. Finally, KB's assistant was able to identify the statement's position in the trial bundle. Judge expressed his doubts that the statement actually accuses Billy of cheating, but notes KB's position that that's the conclusion to be drawn from it. At that point, Judge said he had no further questions for KB. At this point, it was just past 1 p.m. in Brisbane, or 8 p.m. for me, so Judge suggested it would be a good time to adjourn. KB laughed that he only went two and a half hours over his estimate. Judge offered BB a short lunch until 2 p.m. instead of 2.30, to which BB requested they meet in the middle at 2.15. If I may say, having not been granted a break in hours, I was very eager to take a piss. Following that, once again, I could catch up on all my DMs, and the immediate responses to the day 6 write-up. As I did this, the sound of two young ladies chatting and giggling throughout the courtroom came through on the feed I still had running. New videos every Monday and Sunday. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Gen X Gamer. Remember to like and subscribe, click that notification bell, and remember, never ever be afraid to be happy. I'll catch you on the next one. Take care.